Hi, I'm Simon. This is the Service Design Show, episode 204. Here's a question for you. Could service design professionals be the time travelers of the business world? It sounds far-fetched, but according to our guest, there could be some truth to this. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push businesses forward, and honor our planet. As you'll hear, our guest Simon Clatworthy isn't your average university professor. He's a design pragmatist, a hands-on practitioner who's been instrumental in the rise of service design in Norway. But Simon's influence extends far beyond academia. He's also a sought-after speaker, a writer, and an all-round design nerd who isn't afraid to challenge the status quo. And did you know, Simon was inspired to explore the materials of service design by the humble workshop, wondering what the equivalent could be for intangible experience. The materials of service design, you ask? Yes, because that's the topic we'll be exploring today. You're going to learn about how rethinking materials of service design, like time, conversations, data, and organizational structures can fundamentally shift your approach. Why the essential building blocks of service design have remained hidden for so long. The surprising parallels between designing a physical product and designing an intangible service and how the same principles of materiality can be applied to both. How service design can reclaim its root in craftsmanship and materiality. Why the design world might have taken a wrong turn when it embraced design thinking. And of course, how the concept of time travel can help service design professionals like you anticipate users' needs, shape better conversations, and create more meaningful experiences. I absolutely love this chat with Simon as it gave me so many new ideas. But if I had to pick one of my favorite parts of this conversation, it probably was when we talked about sculpting services with the same intention and artistry as a woodworker or potter shaping their materials. I'm curious how this will impact the way you think about your work. So please join me for a great conversation with Simon Cladworthy, and I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Simon. Hi, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you as well and to hear you for the people listening to the podcast. I'm going to give a fair warning. We'll have to see if this plays out, but I think we're going to geek out a lot in this conversation. What do you I've, think? I think this is going to be total nerding, uh, but I, I, I love nerding and maybe that's part of my job, but uh, I think there's a resonance in, in this nerding. So I hope you can stick, uh, stick on and, and see how it turns out. I think half of the audience joining us in this conversation will love it and the other half will tune out after 10 minutes. So let's see which part of the audience you belong to. Simon, um, you co-authored a book called The Materials of Service Design. Yes. What? Okay. So much to unpack here. Let's start with materials. <clears throat> what are yeah. materials, Simon? Well. Uh, materials are central to, to design and architecture. And if you're, I come from a design school and we have a workshop for wood, we have a workshop for plastics, we have a workshop for metal, 3D printing workshop, 
uh, material exploration is a central part of uh, all of the, the product and industrial design and architecture that we do. And it got me thinking about what would a workshop for service design be like? Um, and that's kind of been nagging in the back of my mind for a while. And uh, I had a question. I, it kind of just kept cropping up and coming into my mind that services are often described as being intangible or immaterial uh, experiences. And design is very much about forming. Uh, and made me think, what are we forming in, in service design? It made me think about materials and the material lab and a, a, a word in, in Scandinavian, and I think maybe you have it in Dutch as well, is this word form evening, which is like giving form to something which is central to design. And it made me think, what are we forming uh, in service design? So that got me thinking about materials and if I can kind of nerd a bit more into that, because materials have different uh, facets or, or definitions. One is, is something uh, that can be formed, something is made out of, which is like metal or plastic or something like that, which is very core to design. But another definition or part of a definition is something that gives individuality, which I think is an interesting thing in terms of, of service. Like, for example, a hard material, a soft material, a spongy material. Um, and you could think, what gives individuality in service? And that's kind of differentiation and, and the customer experience, I think. So there's the individuality facet. And then there's uh, an aspect of material, which is material for a semester, for example, like reading material. And that made me think, what is um, uh, what? What should the content? What what's the material for a service design course? So it is a relevance there, and the final one, which I quite like, is is like the comedian's material or the magician's material. Like uh, I always think of design as being slightly magic for for many people. Um, and what's in the in the material toolbox for the designer? So so materials. Once I started scratching into the surface, there was a lot more depth underneath that all fitted together in a way uh, and made a good content for the book because we cover all of these things uh, in the book. I love it. So one of the first things we need to establish for the rest of our conversations is that materials aren't per se tangible. Tangibility and uh, being able to touch and feel, well, feeling is maybe different to touching, touching seeing, smelling a material, those could be material properties, but materials go beyond that definition, right? Yes, yes. That's uh, super important to establish. Yeah, and I think it's important as well to think what we do with materials. Uh, can, I, can I show the cover of the book? Because, you can. Uh, the people on the podcast won't be able to see it, but you need to describe it for them. Okay, because um, on the cover, uh, I'm quite pleased with the cover, which is why I want to talk about it, really. But we have uh, four different tools that uh, can be used to, in terms of materials, as we, we call it. There's a, there's a pencil, which we put there, uh, and the pencil is for creating something out of nothing. Uh, the pencil has multiple possibilities, and it's like, can create something from nothing. And then we have a scalpel, uh, which can be used for removing or separating, dividing, parts or whole. Um, and the third thing we, we added was the uh, conductor's baton, where, where the conductor uh, orchestrates uh, or coordinates or synthesizes, depends how you look at it. And I think that's um, an interesting one for, for uh, service design or for design as being a synthetic uh, 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 discipline. And the final one was a digital pen. It's an, it's an Apple pen. Um, or Apple Pencil, I think it's called, which really does all of the other things um, and more. Uh, and it kind of heralds the, the digital multiplicity of, of, of tools. And I thought these are things that kind of remind the, the reader when you see it that most designers were forming things and were doing, manipulating, changing, creating. And that was a kind of impetus to, to get us going in, in, in the book and looking at the materials. Does that make sense? Yeah, for at least for me it does. Having tools to shape a mold 
the world around us to yeah. get form. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting to think about those tools. I would, before we go into some of these examples of what materials or services are, let's maybe take a moment to explore where the design field and maybe specifically the service design field took a left turn from the design tradition and sort of forgot that it's actually thinking and working with materials because up till the moment that we were doing product design and architecture and all those quite <clears throat> bodily connected areas of design, materials were very obvious uh, part of that process. And then somehow we got into service design and then we forgot that that is actually a very essential part of the field. What, what's what's your take on this? What happened? I've been thinking for a long time that, that like design has gone through several stages and designers have in some ways um, promoted themselves by putting on other people's clothes in a way of like being an engineer for a while or being... Uh, uh, focused on business and design thinking. And I think when service design came along, it emerged uh, in the design world, at least it came from a kind of business and marketing area. And it emerged around the same time as design thinking, a bit before design thinking, but like it, it grew in parallel, I think. And I think uh, I mean, I, I love Tim Brown uh, and the design thinking idea, but it did kind of exclude, it kind of took the scalpel and removed the material part, I think, and the aesthetics part. And I think we really enjoyed the popularity that that gave, and we actually could contribute something. And, and one of the core parts of, of service design, the, the, the journey uh, and the touch points came from, from uh, business and marketing. And, and I think we rushed into that and we were tried to differentiate ourselves from the other design disciplines in this new world. And maybe we should have stepped back and looked a little bit about some of the core aspects of design, about the materials, um, and question that. And it, it's strange that it's so long after surface design has taken off that we're actually unable to adequately kind of summarize what are the materials of service design. Mm. I mean, we're taking a stab at it in the book, but we haven't actually, we haven't got the answer, uh, and maybe there will be no answer in that way, but it, there should have been a huge discussion about it, I think. The rise of design thinking is a curse and a bless at the same time. Design has been be, become more uh, a household idea. Um, but at the same time, we have lost the depth of what it means to design. So we, the field has attracted a lot of new enthusiasts. Um, yes. That yeah, haven't, I think so. Yeah, that haven't gone through sort of the, the historical perspective of what design is. But to, to add to this, Simon, I was also reflecting on this um, while reading the book and sort of thinking about our conversation. And one of the thoughts that emerged for me was that there has been a very strong emphasis on popularizing design and spreading the word of design, evangelizing design. But there hasn't been an equal amount of debate around services. And I think that's actually the core that we have missed in the last 10, 15 years and that got us to the point where we are today that we don't have a good understanding of what the materials of a service are. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and there's a couple of things that, may, that you triggered there in me. One was that this thought of um, aesthetics, which we can come back to later, but, but there's, there's like the aesthetics of service, the discussion about the aesthetics of service and the aesthetics of service design is kind of not non-existent and uh, you when you mentioned what you uh this kind of popularization i just 
were thought of uh, coffee table books. You know, that the traditional kind of furniture books or interior books that the people have hanging around or photographers or something like that. And I just thought, yeah, what would a service design coffee table book look like? And I'd, I think it would actually be quite interesting. Uh, and I'm not sure if it would be a book or it would be something else, but I, I like the idea of trying to make that analogy uh, and I think maybe what this is about is trying to make kind of analogies between the different design fields and use some of the key things and think, okay, what, what does that mean for service? Um, the aspects of, of core of design, which is in the making, really. Well, it's all making. The analogy here, and we'll, we'll probably make a lot of analogies that uh, aren't 100% uh, valid, but I was thinking about, okay, so you have a book uh, a table, coffee table book about service design. What if the cover would be car design? There would probably be quite a lot of nuance in that book and nuance around what, like, what does their interior look like? What are the specification of the engine? Like, what are all the different properties that make up a specific kind of car? I think from what I'm seeing in service design so far, and I'm, maybe I'm being pretty critical, but this is what I've been observing, is that we just have a cover that says service design and nobody has taken the effort to actually unravel and add sophistication and depth to what are all these elements that make up a service. We just, we just, we just give the label service design or service designer and then sort of brush off our hands and that's it. Am I being yeah. too too skeptical, too critical here? No, I think it's a, it's a good point because I think service design has developed from some core elements uh, and has, has nuanced itself, but it hasn't really questioned those elements directly uh, that much, I think. And it's been swayed and sucked into the design thinking uh, vortex, uh, which has created tons of, of recognition and tons of great things and great change. And I think we've been kind of a bit seduced by our success and not questioned and stopped and, and thought. And, and maybe that kind of makes sense in the historical sense. It's maybe time to stop now and, and look uh, and take a position. In, in, I, I don't know if you've talked in your podcast earlier about service dominant logic, but the, the emergence of service dominant logic in in marketing uh, and business was very much that services were always compared to products and the difference between services and products and service dominant logic kind of came along and said well let's think about service as service and the essence of service and and what is it what characterizes it rather than what it isn't or how it's different to something else and maybe our I've been a little bit inspired by that in the, in this book together with with Stefan and Johanna. I need to mention them because we're co-authors on on this book. Uh, but we've been kind of stopped and looked around and looked back and questioned some things. I think um, and then this fundamental question about what are we actually forming uh, is is key. And I think it's something each service designer watching the the, the show needs to think about for themselves what what are we what am i actually forming in the, in this project that like, what am i forming directly and what am i forming indirectly because that's a key thing for your own identity i think and for the the identity of the discipline and uh yes what are you forming in your identity i i recently also shared another post uh on linkedin that i think we really st should stop using the term service designer. Um, it has served us quite well in the recent years to build recognition, but it doesn't do justice. And actually it's causing more harm than good at this moment because you, we are starting to lose credibility when we position ourselves as people who can design the entire service. It's just, for me, it's equally the same when you say, I'm a car designer. Like no, nobody is able to design a car. Like you need so many different disciplines to get to ship that product or ship that service. Um, 
and I feel we need to level up and add, like I said, depth and sophistication. And you mentioned identity. So what, what role do you take? What skills do you add? Which interests do you have that contribute to designing a service? I think that's a, that's a good point. Uh, but I'm just a little bit, I'm not sure I totally agree with you. And I think part of the reason is that I, I think that it, it depends a little bit who you're talking to. I, I think if you're talking within the design world, then you might describe yourself as a, as uh, being specialized in some part of service design and you'll get recognition. But if you're talking to people who don't know the design field, I think service design is quite a good title still because it it gets the question, what is service design? Uh, and I I really enjoy struggling <laughs> struggling to try and describe service design to people. But um, I was talking to somebody. Actually, I was it was uh, at, a, at a funeral service. I was talking to to the vicar, and and they said, um, "Well, the priest is." Uh, what do you do? And I'm a service designer. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Say some more about that. And I talked about it and it's like, yeah, and really church and church services are, are services. And uh, and this, uh, and to started to describe the touch points of a church uh, and a religion. And I thought that's really interesting because they picked it up straight away. Um, so I, I, I quite, I still think the term service design designer has as an umbrella is a good term, but I think it's diversifying rapidly. Um, it's specializing. It's specializing. It's uh, And that's something that we kind of saw in, in the book when we looked at different materials, is that there's a, there's a very vast range of materials from the kind of ones you'd expect, like uh, touch points and interactions. Yeah. We're dying to hear a few of these uh, materials. We've been chatting for 20 ish <laughs> minutes and we I haven't know. touched upon these materials. So, Simon, can you give us, I don't know, two, three, four, five uh, examples of materials that have been identified and described in the book? Yeah, I, I, there's, a, there's a whole, uh, this, this, some from, from my point of view, which I think are, are kind of ones you'd expect to be there, like the, the, the service offering or value proposition. I think the designer is forming together with others and all of this is, is co-design really but the designer is forming and maybe having a great to responsibility than others in a team maybe to develop a service offering or value proposition um, and that is a kind of higher level area and it links down to a customer journey and touch points which are also materials i think the the journey can be formed and described and um, changed and in the forming something happens which can make it better or worse but generally it's in the forming that things things ideate it's not just drawing what you've thought it's actually forming something and the dialogue actually happens there so they're kind of more traditional ones and then we have some which are more indirect materials like your uh, forming, we have a chapter about forming the organization. And um, that's maybe not something the service designer does directly, but indirectly through the approach and the uh, user centered focus and the focus on the experience, maybe that it changes the way the organization works and is structured. Uh, and also the service itself restructures an organization in many times. So, so the service designer is forming an organization. Um, one that I think goes back a little bit to the kind of core of design, which, which I quite like, is, is culture of service designers being aware of the culture around. Design has always had this, this term, the zeitgeist, of, of like the spirit of the times. Uh, it's a term that kind of took off in the 20s or 30s, I think, the zeitgeist, is, uh, things changing in society and design picking up on that and translating it into service or products or something like that. And designers are influenced by that, but also by creating services that fit into that culture, they're forming the culture as well. Um, and it's, it's this is maybe a more functional example, but if you think of, of Amazon.com uh, as a service, which, which it is, then 
it picked up on the spirit of the times of a huge, uh, the long tail availability of almost everything, uh, clear structures for uh, transactions, reviews, all of these things that were, were very new at the time. And that has transformed society. Uh, so it, for better or worse, in a way, Amazon picked up on something in culture, transformed it into a service, and by doing that, change service, because all services are, in many ways, children of Amazon, I think, all transactional services anyway. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So I was Shall reading- I go on? No, hold can I... on. <laughs> you can, but give me, a, give me a moment. I was reading yeah. through the book. I think I'm um, at material number 12, something like that. And in each and every chapter, I was going like, yes, yes, exactly. So to me, all of them so far resonated a lot and um, captured something that sometimes I knew implicitly, sometimes I already knew explicitly, but all of them were like, yes. Um, and it's, it's interesting and I'll do my best to start a playlist here on the show. Some of the people who are also in the book, because the materials have been described by various authors, have also already been on the show. So Claire Dennington, I think she called, she talked about culture. Tim Matthews talked about rituals. We've had conversations about conversation design. We've had conversations around organizational design. So I think if we do our best, we could, I don't know, maybe already half of the materials have have been explored more in depth here on the show. So that's quite interesting. Yeah, I think maybe you should have written the book, actually, thinking I don't about it. I'm from happy the, that from you the took the effort. <laughs> the 200 shows, you've, over 200 shows you've done, actually, that would have been a very good uh, uh, structure to, to do it. But I, um, yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I could maybe throw the question back to you about it. Are there any materials there that, that surprised you? Because I think this, the surprise is the interesting thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had the same question for you, but okay. uh, so far, um, I don't know. I, I've been positively surprised by each and every one of them, to be honest. Like I, the, the most recent chapter or conversation that I was listening to was with Chris Downs about data and data yeah. as a material. Like that's not something that I think about on a daily basis, but now that it has been described in this way, I'm like, yeah, absolutely, like 100%. So that was that was something that's not top of mind, but very obvious when it was described. Did you have something similar? Well, I, um, data was what I wanted to put in there because I thought data was interesting. Uh, and I, I think it's a kind of, it's a bit of guilt from a, coming from a design school because I don't think we focus enough on, on data as a material. I think that this, there's two sides to it. One is one is the data as a consequence of decisions made in the design process. There's ev everything becomes more and more digital, so there's a lot of data as a consequence. But the discussion with Chris Downs, which really inspired me, was like data as a source material of of like a raw material to to be formed of understanding the data and and working with it. And it was really nice to. To, to talk to him, to interview him, because uh, he said, like, oh, I've thought of data as a, as a mid core material service design since like 2002 or something like that. And now finally I have the chance to talk about it. So he wrote, it was a very interesting interview. Um, and, and it made me think, yes, we need to integrate this into the course in, in a way. And, and we're, we're going to do that, I think, in the service design master course. Um, one that surprised me. And it shouldn't really surprise me because it, it's from a collaboration with, with, with somebody I know quite well with, with conversations. Um, and really, it, it brings home something that we talk about in design a lot, of like designers asking the right questions. And those questions can be kind of uh, important questions that you might feel are a bit stupid uh, or detailed questions, which kind of get to the really get to the point of, of, or core of something. And he wrote a, a chapter about conversations as a material because he studied it and found that the 
type of conversations change during a project from being kind of uh, explorative, strategic at the start to becoming very operative as you move through. And being aware of that, it made me think, yeah, if you're aware of the conversations, then you can design the conversations, you can form the conversations to achieve what you want to achieve. And it's a very reflective thing, but what you want to achieve with these limited conversations you might have with management, for example, or limited conversations you might have with uh, users or front-end people. And thinking of conversations as a material actually makes you better as a designer, I think, especially a service designer. Let's, uh, let's grab this one because there is an underlying question here that, uh, that I want to explore. So if we stick with conversations, and think about conversations as a design material that you can shape and give form to. One might say, you know, you you can't actually form the conversation. It happens in comparison to you take a piece of wood, which you can physically manipulate in the moment. And then it takes that specific shape conversations like do we have tools to shape them in that? Is it, how does that analogy work from your perspective? Well, I think I think it's a it's an okay analogy from from my point of view. I, I mean, if you're thinking about the custom insight work, a, se a semi structured interview, for example, that's the structure of the questions you have shapes the conversation, and I think the ability of a, a good designer who's good at inside work of uh, getting people to talk, but also being able to kind of divert the conversation towards interesting areas or tease out things. I think that's a conversation. That's, that's a way of forming a conversation by having some structure and by being reflective uh, and having a kind of, um, what's the word? A mm -hmm. kind of meta discussion within your head about what, what do I need from this situation now? Uh, the conversation flows, but uh, and and you're probably doing it right now in this this podcast of like, okay, this uh, I'm listening to this, but at the same time I'm thinking of the next question or where I'd like this to go. And I think that's how we can form a conversation. Uh, and uh, it's it's I think it's one of it's, it's something it gets to kind of a core of of, of designing really, which I uh, mentioned a bit earlier. But I think it's really important to get across is that. Design happens as a dialogue with the material. Like when you're talking about wood, as you form it, you change it. And the idea you have as you try to create a form changes as you're working with it. You have this dialogue with the material due to the material properties, um, which is why car designers still make the original forms for, for cars uh, using clay. We have clay workshop at our school. Uh, it's called car clay, and it's a special clay that you can use for this. And, and designers um, start with some, some ideas, uh, some concepts maybe, but it's in the making that it actually, the magic happens, uh, if you want to use the word magic. And I think that's something that we need to think about in in service design it's like under during the process the thing is formed mm -hmm. um and to kind of realize that that and that's that's the difference here i think in service design is that it's co-designed it's co-formed and many of the materials uh which we kind of tried to, to categorize uh many of the materials are actually materials to improve co-design and maybe are not visible in the final mm -hmm. uh, in the final service the the thing that makes that we need to get better at is again let's let's stick to clay or wood we can observe how things are evolving like how we're forming the thing in this case we can see it we can touch it and that makes it makes it very vivid when we're yep. shaping a conversation i think there are equally the same 
things we can observe, but we haven't yet developed or get, got familiar with the language around that. So we don't have the senses or taste to say, when I observe this conversation, it's actually a very friendly conversation. It's very open, uh, right? Those, yep. I, yep. I think it's absolutely possible to recognize those properties of the material. Maybe that's, that's the uh, leeway to what we need to talk about is with wood, we can define structure, we can define um, color. Like we know we have defined some material properties. Yep. I think there is, a, there is a long way to go to do the same for the design materials of design, like a conversation. What are the material properties of a conversation? And once we have mapped those and are familiar with that, it's going to be, I think, equally easy to see them, to experience them. That's a great reflection. I really like that. Um, I, I think that the um, it gives a kind of different perspective to the idea of like if you've uh, organization as a material and understanding the material properties and its uh, feedback mechanisms in many ways. Because you, what you were talking about with wood is a kind of a direct feedback that's instantaneous. And in organizations, it's far from that. It's, it's like many years maybe. Um, but the properties... Uh, of the material. I mean, you can use uh, analogies to kind of uh, hardness, uh, grain, sheen, all these kinds of things. I think they could all be used in a way. And, and I, th I think, I mean, uh, that there's a huge amount of research about organization and organizational change. But to look at it from a designer perspective, I think uh, like the forming properties, I'm not sure if there's that much from a design perspective. I mean, the, the, um, I was talking to somebody yesterday about the, the theory of change and how relevant that is for service design. I, I don't know much about the theory of change, but it seems it's, it's gaining traction in, in, in many ways about uh, uh, organizational development. But I think it needs to be seen from a designer perspective uh, because I think, I don't know, I think it's one of the key things about design is that design is, again, it's about forming, whereas many other disciplines are about understanding. Uh, and there's a difference between understanding what wood is and being able to form wood uh, in, in a specific way or in a desired way. And I think the, the designing and the properties of, of the materials is something really worth exploring um, uh, individually. Yeah, This is, um, for me, it all makes sense. Like you said, the role of a designer is forming and most likely making the translation between what's possible and what is desired. So when somebody is thinking about a car or a phone, they are translating the opportunities and options around design, available design materials to what, what do people actually need? And then making that connection between, you know, I, I know that there's a new technology to shape a mold aluminum. And now we're going to have aluminum unite bodies MacBooks because that appeals to a certain category of people that we want to address. And the same can be applied to services as well. Once you start understanding what's, what are the materials and then trying to bring them in and apply them to the people you're designing for. For me, it sounds pretty obvious. Yes, I, it, it, it is, but I haven't kind of thought of it in that way. So it's really nice that you, that you bring it up. And I, I totally agree with you of, of more and more thinking of the designer as a translator uh, of something into something else, like needs into a form or needs into a service or uh, transforming some technological possibilities into a journey or some touch points. I think this, this translation is, uh, I'm becoming more and more aware of, of designer as translator. Um, yes. I, I like that thought. And and that's, well, I, I don't think it's anything new, but um, 
do you have a different material than let's say conversation just to to change up our conversation and see <laughs> if that still holds pick one of the uh 18 that you've defined i mean do you want uh, let's, let's think time i think time is a good one because because that time was both like our perception of time and what and the real and the time it takes but also timing i think this like time is and it's also something that is is quite distinct from at least uh, industrial and product design very much in in, in the service is a time based media so maybe it's more related to film or theater uh, so i think it's understanding the characteristics of time are, are really interesting again let's try to explore this what would be material properties of time um well time is in a way it, it it's both rigid and flexible i would say because it's it's like it it can be absolutely measured based on on some system we've agreed but it's perceived in different ways uh, and we've all experienced flow uh this wonderful term of flow where time and space kind of disappears uh, like that magical feeling of coming out of a uh, a cinema and suddenly like wow was was that two hours mm -hmm. uh, and you've been totally uh, immersed in something so so time allows for immersion and it it can be uh, compressed or expanded individually so yes I, i'm loving this simon because um uh, we're at least my mind is going back and forth to products so like you said time is absolute and flexible the same goes with physical materials if you take a certain piece of wood that wood can be expressed in very uh, uh, physical properties like stiffness or whatever at the same time you can uh, devise a style or like you can have a luxury type of wood luxury isn't like an in inherent material property it's a device material property the same goes for time you can sort of measure time like you said and quantify it in seconds but you can enjoy time or you can have a good time <laughs> yeah versus you can be bored yep right yes and and the same the same way of thinking about designing with time what do you want what, do you want people to be bored like then pick a, you can shape a mold time in that way. Yes, and I think being aware of it, uh, and and also combining time and timing. I mean, uh, mm. uh, as a, a kind of having a, a, a history of, of for, from interaction design, the timing of transitions uh, is, is really key, and timing of stages of the journey. I mean, I worked with a with a service which uh, everybody thought it was fantastic but it just turned out it all fell apart because of timing of a certain key step everybody assumed it would happen but it happened four hours later than expected because of a kind of technological thing uh, and it just ruined the whole experience uh, so that the the timing of a stage and the timing of a transition can be super important which we all know from from film cross clipping and things like that uh, it's really interesting to think of that in the service context of using the analogies from from film, uh, first person, third person. These are really interesting aspects of of time and movement that we can relate to characteristics. Mm -hmm. You got me going now. I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> so now <clears throat> the interesting thing here becomes. Okay, we're starting to identify some design materials of services. Time, data, culture, organization, and the list goes on. Um, the same goes with products. We can have wood, plastics, metals, um, whatever you can come up with. How? What does this mean for service design? And the question behind this question is... Can we expect any single person to be a material expert on all of these things? That's a that's a good question, and I I, I think the the answer is is no. You can't be an expert on all of these things, and and uh, in the same way as 
uh, a product designer, you might be a specialist in plastic uh, or, or wood or, or metal, but you're aware of them and you've explored some of the others. Yes, but and and yeah, and and that is sort of going back to my previous argument that the label of service designer specifically, like likes become becomes debatable because, like, are you are you designing? Do you know everything about designing with time and with culture and with the organization and with data? Well, yeah, yeah uh, you should probably be aware that those other materials exist and should and could be used but do you have in-depth knowledge and experience about how to shape and form them yeah i think that that's a that's a good point and when we're seeing i think specializations of of within service design and it goes back to this definition of, of material as being like the the comedian's material or the magician's material like the the toolbox what have you got in your toolbox uh, what are you specialized in and i i, I think uh, also, it relates to the identity of different service design courses because there's a difference. I, I've, I've taught on several service design courses and there's a difference between design school service design uh, and university service design. Uh, and I think they have different um, strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's it's important to be very aware of what we put into those toolboxes or containers of materials or material knowledge. I, I'm not sure, or just the material library of, of it. You could imagine what would be the material library in the design school might be different to what it would be in a in a university uh, service design school. Mm. Uh, and and again, could be different from a technological university to a humanities university, for example. So, I think we're we're seeing the emergence of different service design specialisms. You you have a strong background in schools, universities. What do you think the implications would or could be? In terms of the the, the differentiation you're you're thinking of, I, I think it's I think it's maybe it, it's an emergence of a um a kind of what how would I call it? Um different schools of service design being taught. And I think describing an identity in terms of we take, the, we are part of this school of service design or we take this approach, uh, we're, we're very focused on the co-design uh, or we're very focused on the aesthetics related design and experience, for example, or we're focused on process uh not so much design process but but delivery process design or something like that i i'm not sure how they will f will appear but i'm they will organically appear i think and it's important for the schools to be aware of it so they can focus the content and differentiate themselves i think you mentioned different schools maybe this links this stuff links to this <clears throat> when i was thinking about materials uh, I was questioning whether or not a specialist in plastics needs to, or how much do they need to know about logistics or the sourcing of specific materials. So you can design a phone with a specific type of metal or aluminum, uh, which is a metal, but if you cannot produce that or source that in the quantities that you want to sell the product at, like that's, that's a bad design. So a product designer probably also needs to know something about, again, logistics. What would this mean for designing with a service? Like what are the e equivalent of logistics and manufacturing for us? I think it's, it's understanding competences. Uh, needed to uh, deliver, uh, develop, and deliver a service. I think I think an understanding of that is is quite is, is central, and not necessarily being a specialist in all the elements, but being able to be aware of the competences that are needed. And I, one of the chapters we interview uh, Lavrance Lovely from Price Waterhouse Coopers earlier uh, live work. And he 
he argues that that competencies are a material. Um, I'm not sure if I agree that there are comp- uh, there are material that service designer forms, but there are competencies as part of a project and being aware of who needs to be brought in at what time and what degree of specialization. I think is 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 increasingly a service design activity because I think the service designer, or I feel strongly in a way, the service designer has a responsibility for maybe the conceptual in a, in a project and that service concept uh, implies specialist competences to, to make it be realized, which is why we have co-design teams, uh, but also we need to call in different specialisms. And I think competence, competences may be material or may be um, a facet of design we need to relate to. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. yeah, I think so. Let me uh, put it in my own words. So when you put somebody who's working on a service design team in a room, you also need to have somebody who's uh, involved with the actual service delivery. And you need somebody who's involved with managing the service. And you need somebody who's involved with the economics behind the service. That's like, you can't just have the service design team in the room. That's that's just like, again, when you're working on the ne- latest iPhone, you need people with logistics, manufacturing experience, uh, sustainability. They need to be in the room having that conversation together. Yes, exactly. And that, that's the, the co-design part. And I think that it's important to be aware of what the service designer is responsible for in in that team that like not not the 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 core design team but the, the the expanded design team which has responsibility for its the service implementation and delivery and uh that i think is 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 important and i think uh the service designer in many ways um one of the things that i mean it, it's maybe a little bit of a tacky title but we talked about the service designer as a, as a in a project as being a time traveler of visualizing or representing future states of the service so that everybody can be on the same page everybody can have the same understanding and i think that's a skill that the service designer has of envisioning or visualizing and communicating it to a team to make it uh, make a shared understanding and i think that um in that way, the service designer is a kind of time traveler because they need to place themselves in the future and have conversations uh, in the present. Uh, did that make sense or did it go off on a kind of tangent? No, way? well, yes, time traveler. But I maybe, and um, challenge me on this uh, if, you, if you want, but I think that the thing, where, where it boils down to with design is that we are the users advocate like our responsibility is to make sure that the thing quote unquote whether it's tangible or intangible aligns with the needs of the people who will be using it i think i think it's as simple as that that's so if you want to summarize the the responsibility of design that's that's it well, I don't, I'm not sure because this is where this is where my design thinking comes in, really. Because then you've got this desirability, uh, viability, feasibility, which is part of design thinking, which is the designer being uh, acutely aware of the the needs and desires of, of of the users, but also understanding where the organization is and what it can and can't lift or deliver, um, because. Uh, it has to somehow be delivered. And also the chance that it has, back to timing as well, timing in the market, whether it's 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 there at the right time. And it's not the designer who knows all of these things, but has to be aware of these things. I mean, it's it's this it's critical point, really. But that's the big difference. Being aware versus having the responsibility because awareness and building these bridges is key. But... Uh, like the, the does it is it um feasible can we actually do we have the it systems do we have the restruct uh, resources do we have the people 
to deliver this service, you need to have that dialogue, but that's not your responsibility as a designer. That's like the feasibility, viability, and desirability, that triangle, the classic triangle. It, it cannot be like put on the shoulders of a design team. No, I, I um, but I think maybe I've misunderstood your design team thought because for me that the design team is it's not just designers it's it's um, the co-design team so that it has it has people from um, uh, process it has people from organization people from HR it has people from the IT department so it, it's a kind of co-design that that has this. 360 degree kind of uh, responsibility in, in, the, in the project. And that team has responsibility, I think, to be able to look at all of these different views. And I think the service designer doesn't have the responsibility to answer it, but I think the service designer has the responsibility to um, check off the most important ones because it's, the service designer, I think, synthesizes multiple things. And that's where the service designer has, I think, a responsibility to make sure that the right things are, boxes are checked. Not that they can necessarily check them themselves, but they need to bring in the right people to do it. And that's where I think the time traveling comes in because they can present this service concept as if it exists, hopefully. Uh, ideally, if we could do that, uh, this is how the service will kind of uh, come across uh, and the right people can then dissect it and say, okay, then we have a problem with doing that or that. We can't do that. We need to develop. These are these are responsibilities other people have, but the designer, I think, needs to raise them. Simon, this um, I'm enjoying our conversation and uh, I'm, I'm curious to, to your thought on the so what question are we just being are we are we having a philosophical exercise which is fun to have but doesn't have any real world implic implications or do you feel that there are implications for practitioners out there for from my point of view from edu education point of view it's really important because if we don't know the materials then i think it, we might mm, be missing out as part of our course if we've, we've ignored something. I think time, for example, uh, an understanding of time is something that I've, I've always thought about, but it's like, we need to get people from theater and, and film into service design. And, and if we've been saying it for many years, but we haven't actually done it that much. And I, that's so, so it's, it has an implication for education and that has an implication for practice afterwards, because if we can nail down the, the education to cover the most important within our focused design area at, at our school, then we can create better designers, which will create better services. So, so I think it, it's, it's not just a, a philosophical exercise um, in, it, in itself. It actually has implications for curriculum design, for how a service design consultancy can market itself. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think there are so there are very easy ways to translate this today into business. So you mentioned theater or filmmaking. If you recognize as a company that time is an element, is an integral element of the service that you're delivering, what's stopping you from bringing somebody from sc film school on board? Right, you can do that today. Or yes. I don't know if you if you recognize and acknowledge that conversations are a key part, like bring a therapist on board. Right? Or yes, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, those those experts are there already. Those specialisms are there already. You just have to recognize that these are the things that you're forming and manipulating. And I don't think we are there yet, but it's not a it's not a decade away. Like this recognition can be there tomorrow. Totally agree. Uh, I, but it kind of takes me back to that conversation we had a little bit earlier about translating, the designer translating. And I think bringing someone from film or theater into a service design project 
that there's a there's a risk there. I think there needs to be some experience and trial trial of it and working with it because there's a risk the the theatre person translates what they understand into the wrong thing um, because they're not used to the context of an innovation process and long terms of development and service delivery. So so I think there's there's an aspect of bringing in the, the specialism, but also being able to translate it the right way. And that's what I think uh, a collaboration between service design, service designers and people from uh, film and theatre, I think would be super interesting. And then they would understand what to translate from and to. I think we, we lack that language at the moment. That mm. there's, a, there's a book uh, which I keep wanting to buy and I haven't got it yet, but it's called How to Read a Film, which is, I really like the title. And it describes many of the key parts of time-based media, um, why they work in the way they work, um, in the same way that I think, as I understand it, that um, I don't know if you know the book Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. It's a fantastic book about the language of um, comic books and how, as you read a comic, you put yourself into that story uh, and what happens really happens between the two boxes. You have a before and something happening, but it's the transition that you put yourself into that story and create the story. Uh, but the whole book is written as uh, a cartoon, which is it's a fantastic book. It's an old book, but it is really a classic. And um, and I think this use of time-based media, film, theater, uh, sound, sound as well, uh, they're all materials that we need to wa- find a way of the, of the characteristics that are relevant for service. I think that's what I'm saying. We need mm-hmm. to pick out the bits that are relevant. Yes. And I'm thinking while you're sharing this, that that picking and selection that's a skill in itself like yes. m- making the decision which like in a product you could say that you are going to make a, something completely out of wood and then eliminate plastic with a service some things are just inherently there uh, culture yep. time yep. data those yep. are in, in, like there would probably be well I, I don't know this is a question mark maybe a question to uh, everybody who's listening like are 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 some things optional? Are these some design materials optional in services, or are they all inherent properties of a service? Anyway, Simon, I want to. <laughs> I want to. Can I, I, wanna... I just jump in on that <laughs> yeah, one? Okay. Quick, quick no, final okay. thing. Go because ahead. I, I think the the model I have in my head of of of, of service design is like a mixing desk, uh, and I think it's a metaphor that we can use of like. I, I don't know. I, I always fell in love when, in the '80s of these mixing desks with like 128 channels, all with their sliders, and it's just a matter of, of understanding, in our context, the different materials and how far we need to put the slider up in terms of how much we need to take account of them. Does that make sense? That metaphor. Yeah. Well, yes. And the, my question was, which sliders are always there like if we yeah. take like if we take cooking like your taste buds will always be there you'll always recognize those five tastes but you'll always also recognize texture and smell uh, <clears throat> so these are inherent elements of the cooking process i don't the, the color well color might not be if you close your eyes you can still anyway Taste. Taste that's going to be an inherent element of cooking, smell, and color. Like those would be things that you could say, well, we, we might, we could in- ignore those. Question is for me, like, what is, what are the taste buds of a service? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a really difficult one. I don't think I'll, I'll jump into that one in terms of offering an answer, but I think it's a really good question in terms of, of like, are, are there, fundamental elements of service time that it always need be, to be designed it must be well time is one yes time is one <clears throat> this is going to be a conversation when i where i hope we get a lot of response uh comments questions critique um 
because that's the next thing I wanted to pick your brain upon. And then we're sort of heading into the uh, final uh, section of our talk. You, this book is here. It's been published in, I think, December 2023. So by the time this conversation gets out, it's going to be half a year. What's next? <laughs> Rest. Uh, no, I don't know. I think it's more, it's reflecting more about the things we write, raise and going into more depth and, and utilizing. And the next thing is really we want people to contribute. I'd really want to create a library of materials. The same way that you have a material library for, for product, it would be really nice to create a library of materials for service design. And Stefan, Johan, and I are making a website. Uh, we're a little bit delayed in terms of, like it should have been launched with the book, but it's on its way. Um, a companion website where people can propose materials and comment materials. So we want to create a living material library on, on, online and hopefully we can post the link uh, together with the podcast uh, so that people can go in and suggest materials and comment materials because I think it's a living thing and it'll be a kind of long tail thing. I think there'll be many, many kind of at the, at the core and there'll be some that are kind of further and further out. Uh, and I just love to see the kind of pattern and, and shape. And I think that's the next stage is to, to think of a material library and be able to go to a material library and think, mm. yeah, I agree with that one. Now, and I'll put that one in my toolbox and that one, I'll pass on that one. Um, and I think that's, that's the next stage. I have some ideas about how we might collaborate on this. So, but that's for after the conversation. Simon, Great. the last question uh, would be, what's, what is the question that you're left with currently? The question um, that I'm left with, and it's related to a chapter in the book because it, it's, it kind of jumped out at me during write, writing the book is that aesthetics of service design. It's a, the question I have is, and I've, I've been reading uh, a lot during, uh, during the winter now on trying to understand the aesthetics of service design because I think that disappeared with design thinking. Design thinking doesn't really mention aesthetics. Uh, and, and I think service design needs to have a discussion and debate about what are the aesthetics of service and what are the aesthetics of service design. And uh, luckily, I've got funding for a PhD to actually try and look at this because I think it needs some fundamental thought and some design work to kind of create Explore, explore it. Explore, like, is this a is this a is this a material of aesthetics? Yes or no? By forming it, and that's the question I have now. And I'm, I, I, we talked about time, and I think time is an important one. But there are other things that I think we need to unearth. So that's my next quest, in a way, mm. is to uh, unearth the materials or components of uh, aesthetics of service. Super interesting, and. The question that has been raised quite a few times here on the show is, what is a beautiful service? Yes. That's a, I hope that you'll be able to shine some light on that in the near future. Uh, I'm going yes. to be following that, that research quite intensely for sure. Yeah, I, and I can just add, it's like also terms of like a well-crafted service, uh, which relates to the beauty of like, being able to say that was a well-crafted service in the way of like a well-crafted product. Um, what does that mean for service? And it links to the aesthetics, I think. Um, and to be able to kind of separate and discuss them, have terms and structures for it, I think it will be wonderful when we get there. Absolutely. Yes, you're doing amazing work, Simon. Thank you for- <laughs> Thank you. And Johan um, and Stefan for taking the a uh, monumental effort of writing a book. Uh, I, again, I'm halfway through and I'm amazed by the number of references and sort of historical perspective that you're able to put in, which whenever I would start a book, I would never be able to. So thank you. I'm extremely grateful. I think the service design field uh, is going to be fundamentally changed by the work that you're doing here. So uh, thanks. Well, that's a fantastic compliment. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, it's nice that our nerding is actually 
uh, being seen and appreciated. Uh, and I love this this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and you've given me lots of new directions to explore. So thank you for, for inviting me on. Let, let's say to be continued. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I'm up for the next one. All right. Thanks, okay. Simon. This lens on service design truly opens so many new doors and exciting avenues for us to explore. I hope you could hear my enthusiasm throughout our conversation. It's a topic that gets me incredibly fired up. By applying this fresh perspective, we can start adding real depth and substance to service design. And the best part is we don't have to start from scratch. We can stand on the shoulders of giants. Learning from experts who have already excelled at shaping experiences, even if they haven't yet turned their focus specifically to services. Think about filmmakers designing with time, therapists with conversations, and countless other professionals shape experience in their respective fields. Imagine the possibilities when we bring the same expertise and intentionality to the realm of service design. If this conversation has sparked your curiosity as well, I highly recommend checking out the book. The links are in the show notes and it's an excellent resource for diving deeper into this fascinating topic. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Please click the like button on the video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you're going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.